welcome, Tom. Thanks, dude. And um, and so I guess the best way to to start this off is just to go back um, and get, <laughs> Let's to do it. As, get to know you as you know this child and how how you know why you are the way you are and how you've got to you know how. I thought you were gonna be like go back to like how we know each other. And I was like, <laughs> all right, calm. Like, but I, I'm sure we'll get to that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Haven't you know? Having a look back, there's quite um, from an early age. You've you know, it, sh it shows that you've got interest in video games, magic. You hacked your school computer, right? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, you've won karate. You've represented England in karate championships and won bought a gold for the under 18s team. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. You're going through the Wikipedia page right now, like straight <laughs> up, like, drawing and, out all those golden oldies. Yeah, but I mean, I guess, you know, where I'm going with this is that you've had these sort of like nuggets of, um, you know, like hobbies at a young age that you've managed to develop and bring into your career throughout your life. You know, all, all these sort of influences of what you did back then have somehow impacted. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, so do you want to go, do you want to start off? I guess a good starting point would be to, was, would you say, was, Feel for Femme, one of your like first ventures that you started? Yeah, that's that's like, I guess that's how you and I really met, just really joke. So when I was uh, when I was 16, I like had to start. I oh when I was 16, I how did I become friends with this dude? I can't even remember how it was, but I, at the time I was DJing at uh yeah, that was it. There was there was like this big uh, wave when I was about 15 years old of people DJing for each other's like birthday parties. So everyone was turning 16 and we were like, oh, you know, we need a DJ and the DJ needs to have speakers and it needs to be able to like perform, like, you know. So I started doing that and uh, it started out with like, I bought a Technics 1210 that was damaged and a CDJ of 300 that was damaged and was trying to sort of learn to beat match with these two different, you know, like things. And I also had like a laptop with Tractor and I was like trying to learn how to beat match all of this stuff together. That was my forte into music. And um, around about that time, I, I somehow managed to black myself onto this pirate radio station in, uh, uh, in Kent, I was it? Fresh FM 90.6 on the dark. In fact, it did feel like it felt like people just do nothing. Do you know what I mean? It's like insides, we're on the dials, like Gad shout out. And they were doing like garage and stuff. And it's like actually like that, that program. Uh, what's that guy's name? Fade Fader. Um, <laughs> inside. <laughs> so I was like, I was really into dubstep at the time because it was like 2009 or something, uh, 2008. Um, dubstep was popping off. It was about to pop off. So I uh, I just copied everything they were doing. I was like, oh, cool, you have that program. And like, as as Tugan said, I, I was uh, you know a bit of a program or a hacker as at the school. So I just saw I was like, oh, you got that encoder, you've got that program there. Like, you need a shoutcast server. And I went home after a week of being or two weeks of being on the station. Just thought, all right, I'm going to do it myself. So I, I bought this domain name, filth.fm, and I started a dubstep radio station and after a few weeks uh i uh i there was a guy i don't know how i heard about him a guy called sam and uh i asked him to to, to help me do it um to throw like uh events at our local bar we're like both underage obviously and um and as like as the station kind of grew which is crazy i was just like hitting people up on youtube like um you know, hey, like, like, you like UKF dubstep, like Luke. I'd be like, uh, you know, all the artists on his page, were like, hey, dude, you know, can you put me in touch? Or hey, like, do you guys want to, you know, DJ on my station? <laughs> and I would just blag it. I'm like, you've got thousands of listeners worldwide. It's the internet man's future. And so, like, <laughs> I actually hacked into Rinse FM's listener thing, and I would always use that data to be like, we're bigger than Rinse FM, <laughs> and it worked every time. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, I wanted to try monetize, so I, I, I tried to do a um, this like nightclub event at my local at my local bar. And when I did that, I got this guy to do the flyers. The guy called Sam, and, and that's one of Tugan's friends. And so Sam was like, "Oh, I've got a friend Tugan who's a drum and bass DJ." <laughs> <laughs> so when we were like sixteen, like we used to we used to 
DJ back to back in a random ass bar in the middle of Kent and with a load of underage people trying to get drunk. It just got lively. So yeah, that's our backstory. So they were packed. I remember they like, were packed. There was a riot once. Do you remember? All the, the the decks would just keep pushing back and back closer and closer where everyone was just like having it out. Right? There was a full on riot outside this bar. And it's like, we're talking about a bar no bigger than this room. You know, it's not that big. And there's a police van outside and people are throwing chairs around in the street trying to fight the police. And we're just like, I just want to play some DJ Hazard and not really, you know what I mean? Go home and have a kebab. But no, that's not how it went down. How, so from that point, how did... How did you end up from doing that to warming up for, you know, Casper, Hadouken, <laughs> oh, um, yeah. or Chasing Status in 2010? Yeah. So, okay. So from that point, I was like, I was, I had this radio station and it was getting thousands of hits a day. We had, we had thousands and thousands of listeners. So I was like, okay, I was really like, a lot of the people that are coming on are producers. And I started to notice this trend, like, I wanted to play at Fabric. I was like, yeah, I really want to DJ at Fabric. And, you know, you guys, I'm sure if you've been there, like, you know about the bass bins at Fabric, that place slaps. So I was, there's a couple of people that were like quite big in the scene that I was becoming friendly with. And they were like, yo, you need to produce. And I'm like, I don't know. Like I, I played like grade one trumpet when I was like nine. I have no idea how to make music. So I downloaded Reason and, uh, you know, I tried Fruity Loops and like, you know, it was cool, but there's something about Reason that I just, my nerdy brain just went, oh, plugs, this is, this is great, I love this. And so I just started going on YouTube and, um, and uh, you know, started to learn like what's reverb and delay and, and how does this stuff work? And I had no idea about musical theory, like the idea of keys. Just, I would literally go online and be like, uh, MIDI for this song and download the MIDI and then just be like I'll take that little bit and just wing it still oblivious to what keys were so I was doing that enough and one night a DJ did a set on Radio 1 and played on my tracks and I just used that as like clout and uh, there was a guy in our hometown that was putting on events and, and booking people like Hadouken and Chaser Status and and I was like hey man like I've got a big pull in this town you know, like I can get loads of people to come, especially if it's like an under 18 event or something. So they let me, uh, they let me warm up for all these acts, which is kind of jokes. So I just blow the shit out of speakers. Like I destroyed those speakers before they went on. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was like, it was, this is the thing, you know, it's like, I, and you're going to see a trend as Tune starts asking me more questions about the crazy stuff I've done. But like when I, when I talk about, talk about it, it's literally about what can you do? that you can use as clout because people just care about clout at the end of the day right it's like you, you don't have to be able to do something if you can show someone you can do it and convince them to get you to do it and hire you you can spend the next two weeks until the moment or the next month until the you know delivery day learning how to do it and then you can practice it, like you know live you know what i mean because that's how opportunities come by. Like the opportunities come by so quickly and at such a mad rate if you put yourself out there in a way where it's like you're hunting for them. You know, every time you see something, you're like, I want to do that. Even if you have no clue how to do it, like you might just get it. And then you can spend the rest, like, you know, you can spend, once you've got the job, you can worry about how you're going to do it. So yeah, that's how that started off. <laughs> really sound advice, actually. And it's something that's crept up just even the talk with native instruments the other uh the other day where you know they were saying with job applications whatever just just go for it like don't worry just just apply like just winging it and i remember like you know some of my sort of biggest opportunities that came was from doing exactly what you just said tom which was just like applying saying you could do it and then if you get offered it just spending the next two weeks not sleeping learning video editing or something like that just from just scratch do it. yeah 100%, man. and yeah um, so no, that's, yeah, that's really sound advice. So how, so from then on, what happened with Phil for Femme is like kind of your first entrepreneurial start and thing that you created. What, what happened to it? Did you end up? Cause you, yeah, moved so, oh, I love Phil for Femme. So Phil for Femme was getting quite crazy. And the way that I did that was that, um, 
the cool thing about filter band was that like okay so it's it's a radio station but what i managed to do is like i worked out that every time you go on the stream you could set uh you could set the title of the stream so what i got djs to do was to put in their name and then i wrote some code that would basically take their name and when they connect to the server the whole like website would change when they connect so when a dj went on live it would be like it like radio one like this DJ is now playing. It's like, here's my profile, here's my SoundCloud, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. for like a, like an independent, that was a big thing back in 2009, apparently. And um, so I was like getting lots of DJs. And so what I did is I, I actually I actually gave this kid like free subs. I was like, here's the deal. You don't have to pay any money. And your job is to like listen to these mixes and get new people on the station. And I charge people 30, 30 pounds a month to play on 4th FM and, you know, and this is what's crazy. Do you know, like, there's artists like Butch Clancy, for example, like, you know, the huge EDM artists. Mm -hmm. I signed that guy. I discovered that guy. Like, there's people like Borgor. Like, he played on my station, like, back in the day. Like, you know, he was big in his own right. But there was a lot of people who really, like, you know, they started out on that station and that gave him a leg up. So that was going great. And I was going to university and, and then I was like, you know, my interest changed. I was interested in... I wanted to be a magician, lol. Um, and so like, I basically, it was fully kind of automated. Um, but yo, know, that, that station was sick. I bought my first car because of that station. Like I, uh, I used to sell t-shirts and hoodies. Like merch is great. Merch is great always. Mm -hmm. And I basically would ship all the hoodies uh, to a warehouse. And then I set up a Shopify store with the warehouse. And they're still around today. They're called like a ship station or something like that. And they just automatically fulfill everything for me. So I didn't have to do anything. Like I just automated every process and got it to the point where I just sat, sat back and let it tick over. And I think that's what ultimately led to its, uh, led to its destruction because I went to university and was just like, you know, oh, I have to focus on my studies now. Can't be doing this thing that got me into university in the, in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So Tom, if we, if we then go on to talk about, um, so you kind of, yeah, went to university and then you then just kind of thought, right, I want to focus on magic. And once again, that turned out to be something quite successful while you was doing it, right? Um, I remember being in Ministry of Sounds in the backstage with one of the artists we were working at at the time. Who and you were you with? Was, was it, who was, it's like, it wasn't, it was someone, was it like the guys who made that song like, duh, 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 duh. Oh, Chucky, all right, sorry. Was that yeah. what you said? DJ, okay. yeah so he was like uh, it was his night what songs did he make he made um that i'm in miami i'm in oh miami. yeah okay right it was yeah. back then <laughs> okay and uh, i remember you just rocked up and just you know just went straight up to him and just was just like dude pick a card and started doing magic so, yeah man straight up the thing is is like once again it, you took you took something like magic and you thought of sort of creative ways and and also in an entrepreneurial way as well to go out and network and um, sort of gain clients. So do you want to kind of just talk a little bit about that? I mean, you, you just like, that's such a great story to bring up um, as that, you know, analogy for networking. Um, like networking is like the most important part of the process with exception to your actual craft. And that said, it might even be more important important than the actual craft because you know like now i see it like the amount of talented people i see like you know that don't work or don't do what they love because they lack the networking skills to be able to you know get it out there so for me back then it was um magic was great because like i taught myself how to do magic tricks and i literally just taught myself like at work i used to work at a golf range and I would sit there for four hours while people came in to go play golf and just practice card tricks for like months over and over again. But that, that taught me how to do card slides. And then it would just be a case of like, okay, well, I'll practice how to go up to people. And, and that, that taught me a lot because you, know, you go up to a couple of thousand, ten, tens of thousands, sorry, people, and, and you, know, you say, hi, I want to show you some magic or something like that. You start to learn how people respond when you walk up to them and go, hi, I'd like to show you some magic. And they're usually like, wow, yeah, please. Like people want to be entertained. So that really helped me in terms of like, okay, like, you know, they're just people, like everyone's just a person. 
And all you have to do is, you know, approach them in a way where they're not going to feel like they're being sold something or they're going to like feel demanded, like they're being demanded of um, or awkward. So like, and then, so that, and that's, that's like social dynamics. So like what I then try to do is, you know, that, that skill, so to speak there, I mean, it's hard for me to offer advice to be like, hey, you guys should all become magicians. That's a great way to get into any industry. But like, I think the point I'm trying to make there is um, being able to go up to someone, you know, seeing someone and being like, that person could help me. The, the networking part of that, how you like start that out, that is super, super important. And I'll use an example from something recent. And, you know, you just have to go up to that person and just start being like, hey, how are you? Like, what do you do? Play dumb in a way, not super dumb if you know who they are, like, you know, like, um, but in a way kind of just try to humanize the situation somewhat and not, and, and from there have a human conversation. And my, usually what I try to do is try to craft a conversation where I'm not going to say, Hey, I'm make this music. and I really love to work for you? Or do you have any advice for me? Cause that's quite demanding. Like, so you want to try and work out a way where you can create a conversation with someone, you know, what are you up to? What are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. What have you done this? Like I remember having a conversation with um, Juice World once I was backstage and I wanted to have a chat with this dude because I was like, I was fascinated by him, but I knew that, you know, like this guy is probably like, it's super hard to, to chat to someone like this in this setting. So I just started asking him about Mario Kart. I was like, who's your favorite character in Mario Kart? And we had a conversation about that for some time. And, and I was like, cool, this is great because this dude loves Mario Kart. And, you know, it, I know that he's going to want to talk to me about this shit. And I love Mario Kart. But at the same time, had you gone in there and been like, hey, here's my music. You know, you're trying to seize an opportunity. It would have been a shutdown immediately. So I think when it comes to networking, like Matsuya mentioned with the situation with, with, Chuck, with Chucky, <laughs> You know, back then, I think in my mind, I was like, ah, oh, Chucky's famous. I'm a magician. I get a photo with him and then be like a better magician. And that's exactly probably what I was doing. So for me, I was just like, all right, pick a card. I'm not going to give you a choice. Like, you know, pick a card. And his curiosity will be like, oh, yeah, cool. Um, but yeah, networking is definitely, yeah, that's a hard one. Like, uh, can I tell a story? That's a tangent, I guess, so to speak. But this is to do with my art career now. Like, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, Okay, so, so you know, I've only been doing art full time for what is it, two two years now, and so uh, the magic thing really kicked off, and I started doing that full time. I spent like seven years doing that, and when I was twenty six, I went on America's Got Talent, and I'm sure Susan's going to ask me those questions about that. But after America's Got Talent, you know, I had um, I had a, like a management uh, company that were working with me, and they're like, okay, we're going to write TV shows. And I was doing that. And, and one day I just woke up and I'm like, you know what? I just want to make art. Like, I just want to make stuff. That's what I care about doing, like building things. And magic wasn't the medium that allowed me to do that in the traditional sense. I remember being on stage. I was doing the ATP world final, like the tennis championship, uh, like gala dinner. And there's like, you know, uh, like Djokovic and people in front of me. And I'm doing this like... <laughs> uh like this crazy deep magic show about like you know empathy in the mind and the set the stranger things soundtrack is like perfectly timed in, in the background with this uh like you know uh music program app that i've got synced up to my apple watch and it's just massively overkill and no one understood it and i realized like magic is not the medium for me to express myself period like it makes a lot of money and I'm successful at it, but it's not how I want to express myself. And so I was like, right, I want to start making art. I just want to make art for art's sake. So when I did that, I decided to just take all my cash and make a load of artworks and put on my own exhibition. And the reason I explain this backstory is because when I did that, someone said to me, I was in a coffee shop, right? And I had one of my artworks on the, on the, on the wall in this coffee shop. And the owner who put it up there was one day next to a guy ordering his coffee and he goes, this is Tom. He made this. And that guy was like, wow, that's amazing. I should introduce you to my friend. He's at Christie's. So he introduced me to his friend at Christie's. And I'm talking, it's like literally happened off the back of a coffee shop, like literally. And this guy, Elliot, he's like, come meet me on Wednesday. And my exhibition was on Thursday. 
and I haven't finished any of the art. Like none of the art is finished. I literally am like in an empty room with a bunch of TVs. Nothing works. I've got 24 hours until the show. I haven't done half the shit that needs to be done. You know, I'm literally, I'm wired. I'm wired. But something told me to go to this meeting with Elliot at Christie's. And I didn't have the time to do it, but I went. Something was like, I should do this. This guy might be really great for me in the network. Yeah. So I pull up to Christie's. I haven't slept. Fucking jacked off at Adderall. <laughs> and uh, I, I, go, I go in and the guy's like, he's just, he's lovely, but he has nothing, nothing to help me with. There's nothing I can... You know, it's just a lovely coffee meet and there's nothing he can do for me. And he's like, let me give, me a t- let me give you a tour. And I'm like, I oblige, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm being polite. And really, I'm just like, I need to get back to my computer and finish this code. So I'm walking around Christie's with him, looking at all of this, like, you know, 18th century art. I just couldn't care less about. And I'm like, all right, let's take a photo for the gram, you know. People love that. So I'm taking this photo and a guy in the distance is like, work it. And I'm like, what? And he's like, work it, baby. And I'm like, what? what are you talking about? And this guy comes over, introduces himself, and we get chatting. He opens his Instagram, and I've verified, and he's verified, and we have this weird social engagement where it's like, oh, we're both going to follow each other because we're both verified, and it seems like we both do something that's cool, but we don't have any clue what each other does. I invite him to my art show, and he's like, his thing says Valentino Ambassador. I think pretty much nothing of it. And so the show goes on, he doesn't come. And then you know, a week later, I get a phone call from this guy. He's like, hey, I'm head of the brand of Valentino. Uh, uh, this guy showed me your artwork. Like, we want you to come do a collaboration with us in Tokyo. And like, <laughs> I'm like, literally my bank account is in the negative at this point. Like I'm on a downward spiral, like didn't sell any art and uh, really in a bad place. And I'm sitting there just like, there is no... There is no fucking way that this is about to happen. And I kept saying it's not going to happen. And next month went by, the next month, well, and then before you know it, it got to November and I'm in Shibuya Square and like all of my art is on the TVs, the screens in Shibuya Square. I'm just like, this is, this is fucking nuts. Wow. So I guess what I'm trying to say with that is I would gladly attribute the whole birth of my art career to be off of that one moment at Christie's because without that one moment at Christie's, I wouldn't have got the leg up. And yeah, you know, I've been in like, I've been in museum shows where they validated me because I did a thing with Valentina and that was unheard of for artists in my space or a digital space. And that all came off of not even just, you know, a meeting in Christie's, it came off of some guy in a coffee shop, like something that I put up on the wall. Like, yeah. it's just the networking is is absolutely vital, and you have to be prepared to be able to give someone a a ten second pitch, a ten second pitch, but in a non pitch way. You can't be like, I got I got an app for you. It's like that Rick and Morty thing. Like, want to build an app? <laughs> like, <laughs> you have to be ready to to pitch what you do in ten seconds without really pitching it, which is an art form in itself. I think <laughs> that's so crazy, man. Like your whole story with Valentino, and that's actually so crazy. <laughs> yeah, really cool. Yeah, it's madness. It's when I I don't really tell anyone this. It's not something I I think I speak much about. But when someone wants to know, I'm just like, yeah, that's the cold hard truth. And don't get me wrong, like I won't lie to you. The thing that the person had saw was me holding a hologram, and I'd made like a 3D hologram, and that was dope. I'm not gonna lie. Like, and that's the other thing, as I said. The networking is seriously important, but you have to have the, the quality goods to back it up. But if you can come out of the darkness and be like, hey, I'm a, like, this is the best part. Like I've done this so many times. I'll be at some like, you know, industry event or some shit or some like BAFTA shit or whatever. And you'll be chatting to some random ass person and they have no idea who you are and you have no idea who that, you know what I mean? And then you'll check each other out later and they'll be like, holy shit, I had no idea. And that, that is the most powerful moment because the conversation was validated by what you do. It was validated by who you are. And if that person likes you, then they're going to go and see your work. And then they'll be impressed because they're like, fuck, I met this awesome person last night. That's super low key and chill. We were like, you know, relate in mad, mad, mad ways. Oh, and it turns out they're actually sick of doing something, you know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's an incredible story. Does anyone have any questions for Tom? 
did uni help yeah. you anything you did in uni like did your course actually help you push you in the right direction I did finance and uh, economics and I had a, a 9.7% attendance rate. So I think they don't actually legally technically give me a degree. Um, I think I'm classed as like a dropout, although I did the ceremony and accepted some kind of weird scroll from someone, but I don't think it actually means anything. Um, did it help me? What did I do during uni? Did it help uh, you on the social side? More I, uh, than the education. <laughs> I lived in a studio flat when I was at uni. Like I was the most antisocial dude ever. Um, I spent my last year of uni learning how to SEO. I, uh, I, I, I somehow managed to bag a client doing SEO for them. And I spent that year learning about uh, Google advertising, Facebook advertising and SEO, which has kind of been invaluable. So yeah, a hundred percent that definitely did. Uh, that time at uni definitely did help me out. Uh, the finance stuff, I mean, yeah, I'm sure the view of the macroeconomic world have, has massively influenced uh, my perception of business. You know, I don't think, I, I, I'd be naive to say it didn't because I think when it comes to artists, people would consider me to be the one that manages to get the business side of it pretty good, especially in a commercial sense. So I think, yeah, 100%, but maybe not in the way that I thought, you know, like I thought I was going to go and be a banker or something. Like, I didn't think I'd go and be, like, this commercial artist um, in that way. Uh, there's a question from Naomi. Have you always been, had, had, had confidence to approach people and say yourself? If not, what's motivated to take these steps? What drives you? Uh, yeah, I have, personally. Like, that's me. But uh, I understand that it's not easy to go and do that for, for a lot of people. And, and uh, selling yourself is quite a tricky, a tricky thing to go and do. Um, I think that, I think that you have to be like a human, right? You have to be empathetic. So whenever you're trying to sell yourself, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the person opposite, right? And that, and that can be like, right. You look at a person and I'm trying to think of an example, like when's a good example. Oh, here's a good example. I met, okay. So gigs, right? I met gigs, uh, I met gigs, uh, well, maybe like eight years ago and I did some magic for him and he's in, a, I'm in a queue of people to do a meet and greet and I'm trying to do magic for him and he hasn't got time for that. So he's like, yeah, kind of, yeah, I'm just posing for a picture and bye bye. You know, it's like, I ain't got time for that shit. Um, and my, you know, my goal there was to get to like do magic for him. This is when I was like 19. And then, you know, so that was the wrong time to sell myself in that way. It just wasn't going to happen. You know what I mean? Like I could have, I got what I, I was there for, but that said, like at the same time, I've been in situations where I've had dinner with gigs and then it's like, oh, now I've got you sitting here for hours. Now I can sell myself. Now I can play the long game. So it's like, I think it depends of how long the person that you're trying to network with, are you at dinner? Are you having drinks? Like, how is it going down? Because to sell yourself in the period of an hour, if you're sit, sat across the table from someone is easy peasy. Like to sell yourself in an email, that's a cold pitch, but like you've got some time there potentially. You always want to try and find common ground. That is it. You want to open your conversation with common ground. Like, how do you relate to this person? I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, uh, some friend, some guy is a friend of mine now, but I was like, I think this guy's cool, but I have no idea how to make conversation with him. And I saw that he liked Pokemon, and I literally just went, All right, Mewtwo or Charizard, come at me. Like, I, I've got a ditto. What are you going to give me for that? You can't use Charizard. Pick any other Pokemon. And then just had a full-blown conversation about that. And from there, let it naturally, let, let, let them naturally want to ask you what you do because then you're kind of chilling. You know, if you go to someone and be like, hey there, I'm a music producer. Can I make a song for you? You're just going to get, like, it's, that's not going to go down well because people are going to be like, uh, uh, no, like, I don't know what your stuff's like and I don't, I feel like I'm being sold to. So, you want to try and you want to try and have a conversation with someone and go into it where you're like, I don't care if you have no idea what I do. I don't care if you don't even see my work. All I care about is you see me as who I am as a person. And if you like me, then you ask me what I do. And if you like me, you'll want to work with me. If you don't like me, it doesn't matter how fucking great my shit is. You ain't going to want to work with me. That's my 10 cents though. Like obviously everyone's got a different opinion. Um, did I, 
did I do a magic trick to get someone to work with me? Yes, a million times. Oh my gosh. Someone to work with me, someone to date me. Like I've used magic like crazy because that that's the beauty of magic is um, there are many people that can do magic. There's like a thousand people in the magic circle. So if you can do magic, I used to go into a confrontation or a situation with the assumption that I can do something that you have never seen and you won't see for a very long time. And I've almost, I'm so cocky and uh, confident. I'm just like, you're going to want to see this. And if you have that air about you, people will believe it. And then how do I end up in a situation where I have dinner with someone like Giggs? Uh, network, literally. Like that was a friend that I met through a friend, through a friend. And I met that person because they liked my art. And I went for drinks with them. And then they introduced me to another friend and that person introduced me to another friend. And it's just like the network goes on, you know, because at the end of the day, these are all people. And uh, it's crazy. Like, I must, I must admit, London is a big part of it. Like, you know, if you're in London and you go into the right places for drinks, this is all pre-COVID, guys. I have no clue how to give you advice post-COVID, but like pre-COVID, <laughs> If you're going to the drink like drinks the right places you're going to meet people and they're going to introduce you're going to bump into people they're going to know people and you spend enough time doing that you know a couple of years like two or three years before you know it you start meet make you start meeting people you start having connects and if they know what you do and they respect what you do and they see it they'll put you on they'll share your work online they'll tell their friends about it and that's how that grows obviously it helps because i used to be able to do magic but yeah, i hope that answers your question that's great, Tom. Um, so if we just move on now, everyone, um, from questions, and there'll be more opportunities to ask questions a bit later on. Um, you, you briefly touched a little bit on sort of social media and marketing. And I guess, you know, in the kind of age that we live in at the moment, um, I, whether you're an artist, whether you're a business, whether you're a magician, social media marketing um, is key to every business, right? So you've been really sort of strategic and have created campaigns that stand out. I mean, your recent ads that have been popping up on Instagram, um, which I don't know if you're, if you'd be willing to share and show. Yeah. <laughs> Can I do that? Um, and just I do that? That's right. A bit about, if you just talk a little bit about like how you built a fan base and use social media, because I think. Straight up. Yeah. Uh, Mm, how do I explain this one? I mean, like I got, I got verified because, uh, I became friends with someone that was, uh, big on YouTube and they knew someone on Instagram. And when I went on America's Got Talent, I asked them if they could ask them to check my thing out. And that got me verified in like an hour. And then when I changed my username and started doing art, it was like, it was like a leap board. So, you know, social media is a hustle and, I'm not going to lie. It's like social media is in the day it's media. And I, I used to like the way my strategy worked was that I believed that the way to grow on social media was to get shared by other people, to get other people to repost your stuff. And so I would try to create empathetic work, things that people would want to share. Um, you know, things that they could use that would make them, you know, make them relatable, like things like filters. So I kind of did that, but if I'm, yeah, if I'm being honest, I was like, that's basically, that was my strategy. Like, I don't have, I don't think I've got a huge amount of followers in the world of Instagram. You know, I see people with half a million. I think that's a lot of followers. Um, but social media is like, it's a big deal in, in the world. Like, it depends what you're trying to do. Like, if you're trying to do like brand collaborations, like brands think social media is a big thing um you need to have 50k or 100k so to speak like i remember when i did the mercedes thing they're like you need to have 100k and i was like i don't have 100k yeah. <laughs> and i was like but, but i can make this <laughs> like <laughs> um so i think you know social media is really important and that really is just like i think now it's changed i think now it's like a lot different and now it's about creating a community. Like, can you create, create a community? And I say create, but I mean, can you curate a community? Like, do you do something that people want to follow? Do you do something that's niche? Do you do something where you talk about what you're doing in a way where it's like you invite others to have that conversation? Because 
And that comes down to a very hard truth, which is, can you look yourself in the mirror and be like, do I make something truly original? And if I don't, then, okay, I can admit that and I need to find a way how I can. How can I differentiate myself from everyone else? Because no one's going to be interested in something that isn't original. And that's what you need to really focus on. I'm trying to be, you know, trying to be original and trying to have a, um, an aesthetic, a sound, uh, an identity, a brand. And to do that, you're just going to have to experiment, which is kind of the fun part because people are going to love to see that. Like I was on a clubhouse uh, a few hours ago and someone was like, uh, oh my, like, they're like, oh shit, like uh, Tom's in here. Like I've been following this guy since he did magic. And I'm like, someone's been following, they've been following me since I did magic. It's been like 10 years. They've been watching this whole process. So don't be afraid to share the process on social media. Like we love to see it. We love to see it. Um, you know, whenever I hire people to come work on projects with me, I'm just like, I just find their social media. I want to see their, I want to see their progression. Where were you two years ago? If I now like hire you for a year, how much am I going to get to see you grow? And how is that going to benefit my project? Do you know what I mean? So that authenticity is good. And it also shows that you're, you know, shows that you can, you can, uh, what's the word? Think on your feet. You know, you don't just have to post finished stuff. Um, but then also just like think about the, the medium. You know, it's very easy to be like lured into like, all right, I've just got to, I'm trying to think of my friends, like I'm trying to think like mall grab, like what's his Instagram like? And I'm just like, he just posts freaking like my new peas out. <laughs> like It's like he made his following somewhere else and then brought them to Instagram. So it's like, whatever the media is you're making, where can that stuff live? How can you build a following there? And then worry about that transitioning onto other places. Um, but uh, let me try and think. I'm trying to think of like musicians and artists that I know that are emerging, like they're following. Like nine times out of 10, it's about who do you know? Because if you're friends with someone, they're going to share your stuff when you drop it. And that's the real MVP. And the cool yeah. thing about music is that like, I know in London for sure, like you'll be sitting chilling at an event and you know, there's like five producers laying around, like 10 songwriters laying around and you start and, and that's the thing. You need to know your shit. You need to know your fucking shit because you need to know that person writes music for that person or that person produces for these people. Because if you go and meet them, they're going to fucking jam with you all day. They're chill. Then, but you know, fucking the like pop star ain't going to have time for you at that, in that moment that like, everyone's going to want to hang out with them. So you have to be really smart, like really smart about how you God, I sound hella manipulative, but it's a hustle. Like you have to be really, uh, really switched on and know why and who you want to talk to. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Tom. And, no worries. Uh, yeah, did you did you have the advert at all that you? Oh, lol. Are able to find it. So basically, like I, uh, as I said, I spent a lot of time doing like uh, advertising um, on social media, and I had learned quite a lot about how uh, you could like link up, uh, you know, conversion tracking on social media. So like, you know, I could, I could build these ads and when I build an ad, I have a video and then I have like maybe like 20 different captions, 20 different descriptions, 20 different audiences. And this program would just like run every possible combination and then work out which one has the cheapest cost per click and which one has the best conversion rate or the highest return on ad spend. So I was like really into that and I was like, oh, okay, ads are really shit on Instagram. Uh, let me screen share. Uh, oh, you need, uh, to, you need to enable uh, screen share, um, for me at least. So anyway, so I, I was like, all right, I'm just going to make a really stupid advert. And I kid you not, guys, this is filmed on an iPhone. And then I found this like AI program online that does green screening, green screened it out. And I bought a uh, like video elements pack from a creator online uh, for 40 bucks and then whacked it all into Premiere. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but can you hear that? No, you oh, can't. No. No. Oh, okay. It's basically just, yeah, I'm just like, I'm just, could it be just the, uh, the microphone thing's turned off on the bottom bit. Can you see the sounds turned off on the actual video? Yeah, but does that work? It doesn't work, does it? Yeah. No. Except I could just hear it really loud. But you can go on my Instagram and watch that, guys, in your free time if you fancy. But um, I was just taking the piss out of adverts. I'm just like, buy my stuff now. Buy now, buy this stuff. Hey, 
you want this, buy it. And, you know, that kind of, that seemed to kick off quite a lot on social media. Everyone seemed to enjoy that one quite a lot. Um, so yeah, that's the thing, have fun with it. You know, like you don't have, there aren't any rules, you know, you can do whatever you want and um, you should definitely do that, like straight up. I'm trying to think of my friend, my friend of mine, Zach, uh, Zach Witness, right? So he just did like, he was the producer on Erica Badu's album, like, and his Instagram is like him popping and locking. Like he's popping and locking and dancing. I'm just like, yeah, I love to see it. Like I love to see it. It's great. It's not all work. Yeah, yeah, that's dope, man. And I remember, you know, like like you said, especially amongst the music community, it can be a lot of when uh, musicians post on social media, it can be quite stale and can just be like, this is my new track with maybe a bit of moving image or the artwork. Um, and I really think it's a good idea for you know all the students and you know when you graduate, start start like putting that creative and fun flair into actually marketing and social media as well as the music that you make as well you know and have fun with it and you know just like when i first saw tom's ads i was in hysterics and i just shared it with all my friends and was like this is so funny this is just so yes funny. generating those ad revenues thank you and, you know <laughs> and, and i and i see really good creative work on social media as well and I like it, but what happens is, is, you know, I'm just quite numb to it. So I like it and then I'll just scroll past. I won't spend, I won't take that time to share it with everyone because I mean, well, one, there's too many things to share and um, two, it didn't stand out and grab me. So yeah, it's just another thing to think about. Does anyone have any questions at all around sort of creating social media or? Have you looked no, into Sorry, go on, Jen, you can go. I was going to say, more than like a question, it's more like a statement that I realised that, like, similarly to, to what we're talking about, the fact that I made, like, a VR game and I posted the VR game and, like, no one really cared. But then the moment I put a picture of me working on it, everyone's loving it. And it's, like, people just need pictures of, like, people Literally. to, like, like Well, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a whole other thing, like, that's because the algorithm is AI driven. So it, it knows what image it's looking at. It knows it's looking at someone's face or it knows it look, it's looking at some VR and the algorithm is, you know, just fundamentally we've all seen documentaries. Like it's trying to get you to use the app. And that's what I say about, you know, content and where it lives. Like I want to post stuff like, hey, this is me building some electronics today. Let me talk to you about, you know, Python. Let's do some code. No one gives a fuck about that on Instagram or at least the, the algorithm doesn't. So you know, um, you have to be like really smart, really smart. I think maybe like those multiple posts are quite good. Um, you know, I know a lot of people will be doing that shit where they're like, they post a picture of them on the flex and then they make some big announcement like, yo, my EP's out. And everyone's like, yeah, sick fit, bro. EP's out, cool. And they see it, you know, you're playing a game. Like you don't own your media, you know, you don't own the, <laughs> the, the playground. So you have to play the game. Yeah, of course. It's just sad. It's a bit like superficial sometimes, but I guess that's like a hundred. A hundred. Well, that's where you got to create your own network. You know, like if you've got your own network of people that you can shout out, and be like, "Yo, bro, can you drop this for me? Like, can you support this?" Um, then you're chilling. You know, like because that's the thing I think is so crazy. Like, what is it? Like, there's I post stories sometimes, and you might get like a couple thousand, or you might like several thousand people watching it, and it's so crazy how like different the content is like shit i care about versus shit the flexi yeah, i'm like exactly. all right i'll post some flexi shit and then i'll make a statement and then everyone gets to see it you know you have to be really strategic because yo the game is the game yeah <laughs> thanks <laughs> cool we've got one from naomi as well any tips on boosting your social media account i've noticed there's like a visual theme to your account this kind of theme right like it's like all about the neons like the blues the pinks yeah i mean uh, yeah you know like it's it's such it's like an art form in its own right like a friend of mine avida she's like an instagram tumblr artist and i would just be like yo this girl's like popping but she spent like 10 years curating this aesthetic and that's her thing it's such a huge deal other people i know like the influencers, it's like, they just, it's their job, you know, like their job is literally, 
like I remember that I'd be like fashion week and I'm sitting there with people who their full-time thing is to make this photo look good enough to post it on fucking Instagram. And I'm like, that that's their job. Like we're out here making creative shit that takes totally different amounts of skills and hours of work. And then we have to do that too. It's like, you know, the, it's stacked against you. It really is because you're competing with people that realistically speaking have a shit ton of time on their hands and that's the that's the way the game has gone you know for them to make something it's a click it's a style it's a click whatever for us it's completely different and it's like more competitive in some capacities or maybe not anymore so like tips for social media like i said you want in- people to engage with you like you want to post something that doesn't look like something someone's seen or doesn't sound like something someone's seen and that means you have to be extremely critical of yourself extremely critical and it sucks it's probably terrible for your mental health and you know but like hey you if you wouldn't be doing this stuff if you had great mental health anyway like you know making art is is a conquest of you know battling against yourself so you know you have to be really 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 critical and and try to make stuff that's consistently or is that in that's interesting that's going to make people you know and as well it has, if it's social media it has to be happy it has to make people feel good like if it makes people feel sad all the time, it's not going to be the vibe. Or maybe it will. Like I did that. I, that definitely worked for me. Like, but I don't think it works all the time. Um, thoughts on TikTok. Literally, you know, I got a friend of mine. Uh, she's a musician and she's like, you know, constantly just making music that goes viral on TikTok. And her strategy is basically write songs that she thinks that will go viral on TikTok. And she's doing that whole thing. And I'm like, that's great. I don't understand it. That's great for you. Get in your bag. Like, find your bag. You go get in it. That's great. But, like, you know, social media is a vehicle at the end of the day. And, it, you know, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, for me, I was like, when I started, I was like, I want to be at Saatchi Gallery. And social media ain't going to help me with that. Like, that happened because I won an award. And when I was at the dinner, then someone there worked at the Saatchi. And then, boom, you try and make that conversation and make that happen you know it's not going to happen because you've got loads of instagram followers do i think ai is a threat to the creative industry do i think ai is a threat to the creative industry uh i don't i don't i've been to a couple of exhibitions with like pretty big artists doing ai things and i think everyone's just a bit like blah like i think ai is a tool i think ai is like you know it's like a door you know like if you use ableton bro or to use cubase like it's like one of those things so i don't think it's a threat i think it's a threat to industries a hundred percent it's going to change it's going to change the world uh it already is changed the world we're all we're all being controlled by an ai we are kind of oblivious to it but the media ai is literally controlling our lives you know like it's having a direct effect on our psyche um so we're already kind of under the influence of ai and Maybe what you guys are making is a function of what you experience and what you experience is a function of what the AI wants to show you. So yeah, and maybe it is a threat to the creative industries because instead of us being free to create, we're pitted against each other with metrics and stuff, right? So maybe in answer to that question, I'd say, try to isolate yourself from external influences because you have this energy and this creative mentality of what you're doing and external stuff will just come and rain on that and take your direction in a different way. And you have to protect if you're sensitive, at least if you're creating stuff, usually people are sensitive, like protect that at all costs. Like, and I never understood that when people said that to me, but what I mean is don't let exterior things distract you and steer you or veer you off into different directions. Try to stay focused on what you're doing and isolate yourself. You know, if you need to work all night, all night on something, do it. Don't let anyone stop you. Like do it because you might not have that energy ever again. Another question. When I say the brand is 100% just you being you or is persona creation key? I know this is subjective and individual, but I was curious about your perspective. Um, nice question. Uh, my brand is definitely uh, 100% me, but at the same time, it's through the lens of Instagram. So it's filtered. Like I make a lot of really crazy dark stuff and it's filtered some to some capacity. But yeah, I just try to be myself. I try to be myself in a way where it's like, I'm not going to be too, what's the word? You know, if I want to make something for me, I don't have to put it out. Like, you know, if I want to make something that I want to express myself, but I don't, you know, I don't share and I don't share. My brand is about like, 
this is what I care about and I want I want to make sure that it's not taken out of context and misunderstood so it's a, it's a very interesting conversation um, but of course it's curated it would be naive to think that it isn't because in the, the day I'm the one deciding what gets posted and what doesn't so in some capacity it has to be curated and so it's like well that's just about you know how accurately do you represent yourself in your lives and I would make the argument that no one can accurately represent themselves online. We all put ourselves through some sort of filter. So I think that's just, yeah, that will happen by proxy. You'll just, whatever you think that you want to be, you'll sculpt that idea out into your digital persona. Uh, I've got a quick question. Um, so obviously your experiences are quite varied and, and with social media, you obviously rely on that a lot. Do you think there's a space for artists to be successful, or well not necessarily successful, but to, to sort of build up this cloud that you're talking about without using tools such as Instagram? Yeah, great question. Um, clout is like entirely subjective to the space you're in. So uh, clout on social media isn't clout in the art world, for example, right? And one thing I've experienced is that like my first museum show I got because I went to an exhibition and walked in wearing this like crazy ass outfit during Berlin Fashion Week. And someone came up to me and was like, who are you? And I'm like, I'm Webb, hey. And they checked my Instagram following and my work and they're like, we should do something. But the guy sat next to me had a thousand followers and he was in the show. And the other dude that got a show at the gallery had 500 followers and he got a show. So it's like, yes, okay, I got more attention. I got more, um, you know, I got more opportunities, but these guys all got opportunities and they didn't have the following. So I think it's about who is it you're trying to get clout with? Where are you trying to attain the clout and for what reason? For me, it was like, I had a list. I wrote this down on my wall on a piece of paper. I was like, I want to be in Hypebeast, Tyson Abiety. I want to be on Wikipedia. I want to have a TED talk and I want to have, I want to be in Wired magazine. And what was the other one? I want to be in the Sartre gallery or something. And I remember having that as a one year goal on my thing, which I thought was mad. And it took me two years to cross off all those things. And so well, almost crossed them all off. Um, and by the time that I crossed them all off, I hadn't, I, had, I didn't even have the piece of paper on the wall anymore. The point, the point I mentioned that is because those things were what I perceived as being clout for me to try and open new doors. So I thought if I had those things, they'll appeal to the, the people that I'm trying to work with in that space. So I wanted sure. that, them for that reason. Now, now all I wanna do is do museum, museum shows, right? So it's like, they don't care about any of that shit. They wanna see this stuff and these things. And so my goals are, all right, I wanna do these things, which have got nothing to do with social media following. It's like, okay, I need to do this stuff. So, you know, write it down. What is the end goal? And how can you make like 10 steps from now to there and then just start going with it. And how is it, how would you break down some of those steps to ever see, you know, like did you, to say, say getting into the Saatchi gallery or whatever, is there like certain people that you wanted to approach or knew that you could help give you a leg up with that? Well, this is the thing is like, I, I saw there was a competition I entered. It was like 20 bucks to do like, um, was it like emerging artist of the year? So I entered that and I just thought, I guess that, that would probably be quite cloudy. I could probably use that as a bit of cloud. And I did it and then turned out there was someone from Asachi at the event, like literally there being like, hey, I love your work. And I'm like, holy shit, this is perfect. And I had no idea what was going to happen. So you just have to go into it blind. You have to be like, what do I think these people are going to appreciate? Like, what is going to be of value uh, to them? Because when I meet them, I might get 10 seconds, I might get 10 minutes, I might get an hour but I'm going to have to say something that makes them see me as someone of interest to them and not someone that's just trying to graft or trying to hustle or trying to take advantage of the situation. They're going to have to look at me and go, this person right here, like, oh, you've done that. Tell me more. Like, you know, because you only get one shot sometimes. Yeah, you only get one shot. You only get one opportunity for that moment and it's not going to happen again. And I've missed a lot of those moments. I've missed a fucking shit ton of those moments. Oh, wicked, man. Thank you. No, no worries. Um, so yeah, let's move on for now. If you have any other questions, just hold it for um, later on, because there's a few things we just want to get to, and I'm just a bit worried with time as well. Um, so Tom, I just wanted to quickly also touch on uh, around the topic of the sort of the realities of sort of having that entrepreneurial spirit and 
the actual background work that goes into it. So things like work ethic, mindset. So if we just start with sort of work ethic, um, how, how many hours a day on average do you work and sleep? And um, yeah, let's start with that. <laughs> how many hours a day do you work? So I, I went to bed at, um, at 9 a.m. today, 10 a.m. I think. And then I just got up. Um, I've been doing that for the last four days. There's been a few pitches that I've been trying to complete. Um, I work flat out. I work flat out. I work um, every waking moment. And then when I get so tired, I basically try to like burn myself out uh, to fall asleep. So, you know, and I've been doing that for a long time, for 10 years, I guess. Uh, you know, work all night, wake up, continue working. When I'm building something like this year, I was building this exhibition that I did. I was programming. Uh, yeah, I call it like a deep work. I woke up, I programmed, I want to take out every day. And I did that for about three or four months. I'd go to the gym, but yeah, constant, 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 nonstop. Um, now, don't get me wrong. It's not always like that. I've spent six months where I've done absolutely nothing every day and been extremely depressed. And I just play little peep on repeat, and, you know, drink whiskey and cry. But like, when you have that when this is what i say about this it's, it's different for everyone but for me it's i find it fascinating a friend of mine works with daft punk and he's telling me how when they make a album like they just go into the out they go into the studio and they have a month and they just make the whole album they're like we'll do it in a month and then they don't touch music ever again until they go and do the next one everyone has their process for me I'm constantly, constantly, constantly working because it's what I love to do. And I don't want to play video games or, you know, watch films. I want to learn more about how can I get better at doing this or how can I advance this? So it's entirely personal, but all I can say is you have to be selfish. You have to be selfish. Like, you know, you're going to be distracted by things and, and you're going to want to do other stuff and that you know it depends like what what do you find fun if you don't find your work fun then you're not doing the right work you need to change the direction so you got to make sure you're having a shit ton of fun and if one day you're like hey i don't like making music but i really like doing uh like installations sound installations stop making music do sound installations for a bit you know until you get bored of that or maybe you won't ever get bored of that because I can promise you, if you look at my work, like I do not do the same thing every day. I'm just constantly like one day I wake up and I'm like, I want to make a video game today. So I'll just do a bit of that. And the next day I'll be like, I want to, I want to make installation. I'll do a bit of that. So yeah, work, work, the work shows, you know, the work show. And that's another thing going into social media. That's something I hear a lot is that people come up to me and they'll be like, um, or like, you know, I'm on the phone. They're like how are you like you're doing so much stuff like geez man you're killing it and i'm like am i i'm like i don't see it like that at all but if you're constantly making stuff and you're working all the time people can't ignore that people can't ignore if you're being consistent and just making stuff and putting it out because that's interesting it's interesting to watch someone burning through like ideas and making things and being wild and experimenting because you're like holy shit like Yesterday, that person did that, and now they've made this. How the fuck are they doing that? It's fascinating. You know, everyone's intrigued by that. Um, you know, if Frank Ocean was making an album every like every month, you'd be sat there like, how is he doing this? Explain that. I don't know where is he getting these experience. You know, obviously that's never going to happen, but like you get the idea, right? I think I think at least. Um, another question. I found myself getting lost in ten billion creative endeavors and lose focus overstretching not completing projects do you have any tips for maintaining focusing focusing or prioritizing goals i create visual collage is similar to your list mentioned but would love to know if you use anything else yeah like being that's the thing right you want to make everything just make a list make a list make a list and just start going through it and making stuff and it's okay not to finish stuff like i am not kidding when i tell you that i've made things that have sat in museums that i've literally thrown together and if you went behind the piece it would just be a mess of wires and a bit of duct tape and um the code would be like something i copied off the internet and just slammed in there and it works and i'm just like okay it works don't touch it you know like you don't have to make things that look polished i mean a lot of people i know are like that they're like my friend is an artist at a big gallery. He's like, everything has to look like it's at the Gagosian gallery. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that's fantastic. But at the same time, you know, I think in our industry, when you're doing stuff that's creative, 
doesn't have to be super polished and super finished. You're experimenting. The point of experimenting is that if someone comes to you one day with an opportunity, you can say, ah, oh, I've actually done some experimentation in that. So I can blag this and hopefully win that deal and win that job. And then I'll work out how to do it really well. You know? So I do that all the time. Like people are like, hey, can you build a spaceship? And I'm like, I actually know a little bit about uh about you know physics and rocket science so yeah and then you're like all right now we're gonna work out how we put a spaceship like and that's the fun part that's the exciting bit because you're like i've got a million dollars and i know nothing about building space rockets but i have a million dollars so like let's find out how to do it like that's that's the exciting part of the whole process um one more question how do you describe your attention span i found myself jumping for a project um i have adhd so you know my attention span is just like constantly all over the place and but i've noticed something very like over the last five years maybe is that i'll have an i'll have a feeling and there'll be something that i do quite often and you're gonna laugh at this guys but i recommend it it's quite uh, you know i don't i've never told anyone this but i, I do this thing <laughs> have you heard of like uh, i don't know how we can do this uh, there's this like thing in clubhouse where unmute and mute your mic is like clapping so if you want to clap you just unmute and mute your mic like quickly but like just give me a raise of hands here like how many of you understand the idea of uh, manifesting? The idea when people say manifesting something, I just get some claps in the room. We've got thumbs up. Yeah. So I never realized what that meant, right? Manifesting. And now I'm starting to realize it. Um, I do this thing where I, I look in the mirror and I, I kind of uh, act out uh, like acceptance speeches. And I've, I've realized a lot of my friends who are like, you know, trying to win Grammys or have won Grammys, like do this as well. And I'm starting to realize like, you know, you're going to be distracted. You're going to get distracted by all sorts of stuff. But if you if you practice like ex- acceptance speeches or you just talk to yourself in the mirror where you're like, uh, this is what I would say if this situation happened and this is something I really want to happen. You're going to start like creating this thing in your brain where you're kind of like, you're, that is your focus is to get to that point. And subconsciously, I truly believe everything you do will kind of be like falling into that main path because I've made these like goals and, I've written them down and then never looked at the list ever again. But just the process of writing them down, I've been manifesting all those things. And as they start to happen, sometimes a lot later in life than I expected, as they start to happen, I start realizing, like, what did stay true? Okay, well, the end goal, where I wanted to go, that end destination, that never changed. I just kept on trying to, you know, like, oh, this is... Oh, when I when I do that thing, this is what I'm gonna say, or when like, well, you know, this is what I'll tell people, and they'll say, "How did you do that?" You know, you just act it out, and I think that that reinforces in your mind that you're already there, and you start acting like you're already there. And I believe very strongly in that because at the end of the day, no one has any fucking clue what they're doing. We're all just pretending. <laughs> I've got another quick question. Um, when obviously you said you had like a six month break and. You know, you're making artwork a lot of the time that, you know, that may not go anywhere, may not earn you anything, might not get an exhibition. Like, what, do you, what have you done to sort of support yourself financially in, in those times? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that period was after I did, like, a, a big collaboration. So I had some cash to sit on, and I burned through it. I just burned through it. Like, I was burning. It felt like I was just setting the cash on fire. And it was horrible because I'm like, I've got all this money to make stuff and all this time. And I just have no creativity. So I think personally, like when I don't have any money, um, I find a way. So like this year during COVID and everything went kind of, you know, went south. I was like, all right, I can make video games. And I just went and did that. And that then first new opportunities. And I did an exhibition inside a video game. But the reason I say that is, you know, you have to make money. No, no one, no one's going to hate you for trying to make money. You have to hustle. And however you want to do that hustle is fine. If you want to have a side job, cool. But the best way to do that hustle is like, how can you use the skills you have? And do not forget, you guys have skills. How can you put those skills in front of the people who need them? And in any way, like there are so many, so many, so many opportunities for people that can, you know, make music. So many. And it's just a case of like, right, how can I put myself in front of those people? Like, how do I do that? How do I get that opportunity? Um, how do I monetize this? And it could be the most obscure thing in the world. It really could. Uh, that said, at the same time, you know, I think I was, when I had my first exhibition for a, at least a year, I was still doing magic. Like I was doing magic at things and I'm like, oh shit, this is awkward. Like I'm, you know, don't want to do this anymore. I hate it, but you know, it pays the bills. 
So don't, you know, depends who you want to be. Like, if you're happy eating beans on toast, and trust me, I've been there. I was there two years ago. Like, I had no money, and I was sitting in my room, and I had beans on toast, and I'm crying, and I'm just like, you know, I'm never going to make it as an artist. And then I've been eating steak. You know, it's going to go up and down. If you're happy with that, and you're okay with that, then, then you know, then just then roll with that. If not, have a side hustle. You know, do something on the side that you can that you can use to fund because I didn't become a, you know, do what I do because I had great success. I did what I did because I had money from another thing and I invested all of it into what I was doing. Like my first show cost me 20 K. I took all of the money I had on my bank account, like every penny I couldn't pay the rent and I just threw it at what I was doing. I was completely convicted. I'm not saying don't do that, you know, but the point I'm getting at is you have to be prepared. Like if you, if it depends who you are at the end of the day, you have to be realistic. Look, you look yourself in the mirror and be like, who, who do I want to, who do I want to be? How do I want to go about doing it? Because I'm sure there are so many people that have done it and you know, it's been a completely different story, <laughs> but that's like my, my story. There's something in here that I just wanted to talk about, which is a Joe, I think who said, welcome to my Ted talk. I've done two Ted talks and I promise you, uh, both of them have been similar, similar. Um, but like, the second one, I came from uh, Privilege and Ibiza, this like club, so my favorite club. I literally came from there at 7 a.m. and I got a flight at 8 a.m. and I landed in Romania and then I made up the TED Talk on the spot. And that I say that because, and I was, I was fucked. I say that because, um, like, this is what I think is so crazy about public speaking. I'm just talking from the heart. I'm just speaking my truth of what I care about. And that is so important. Like in any situation, whenever you're trying to do something, it's like I was saying about talking in the mirror, practice that practice speaking your truth. Like, what do you do? What do you care about? Who are you? How do you identify? Because if you practice that, no matter where you are, like you'll be able to get up in front of anyone anywhere and say something and it's going to sound confident and people are going to believe it. And if they believe it, then, then you're pretty much halfway there. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, so just another one I wanted to um, ask you actually was, uh, so you, over the years, you've obviously built up so many different technical skills across so many different areas. Um, can you still I'm hear? Still here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm wireless. I just need some water. Awesome. And, um, and yeah, so I guess what I wanted to ask was for the students, they're about to graduate and they've developed the theoretical, technical and some experience within sound. But what else in the creative industry, what other skill sets in their spare time do you think they should be sort of learning like that would kind of help them or open up more opportunities? For instance, like, you know, how to code, you know, how to do SEO. Um, you've learned about marketing, you know a bit about finance. So like, what do you think are the most sort of key areas and skill sets that have helped you out massively along your journey to support um, your art yeah so. good question uh number one i'd say is like networking right so like uh, for me it's like social dynamics i think is the thing that i spend the most amount of time studying so mm -hmm. how do you approach people how do you talk to people how do you cold call people how do you because in the day you're doing you know, everything you're doing is going to be a function of a conversation interaction with someone so you know that is the be all and the end all that's the gatekeeper thing unless you're like you know going to be the next avici or something like you know you you have to you have to be able to make those connects um and then yeah it's hard to like recommend because um it depends what you want to do like i personally like i believe very strongly in like being able to code and i think building electronics is so cool like so key because you could be in any situation if you can code and build electronics you can kind of just build anything for any anything you know what i mean if you're trying to make installations or something um so i think like having some kind of technical i think computer skills are important learn about um you know some sort of coding and that's so generic but uh i think you know, if you guys, it depends really, I guess what, what people are you know trying to do really. I think maybe that might be a good question to ask. Um, ask the room guys, like maybe you can just drop in chat. Like what are the things that you're trying to do? Like what, what would you like to move into? And perhaps I can maybe just suggest what I think might be a good, a good bunch of uh, things to learn um, if you're trying to go in that direction. 
Okay, so run a label, release on that label. All right, well, that's uh, <laughs> that's that's going to be like, obviously, you need to know a lot about business, right? You're going to have to know about setting up a company. So you want to go and learn about business, that's for sure. Um, sound engineer and events. Sound engineer, like, that's, yeah, the, I, I mean, from what I know, it's like sound engineers usually come with a studio, right? So you want to find a studio that you can work at alternatively you're going to want to meet producers who are going to want to work with you and use you as their sound engineer. So that's going to be about your network because honestly, like, you know, and if you're a sound engineer, like if you're good at what you do, you getting to work with someone incredible might literally just be a chance coincidence that you bump into that person. Right. Like it could be that, um, video games, uh, VR music experiences, like, yeah, well, that's, that's going to be a hundred percent. Like, uh, you're going to want to learn how to code. You're going to want how to do stuff with unity. And, um, yeah, that, that's the thing. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, whatever you want to do, look at every single job in that industry. So, you know, if you want to run label or you want to make VR installations, look at every single job that would be traditionally associated with creating that thing and go and learn how to do it because then you're going to be able to do it yourself. And if you go into any work environment, you can sit there and constantly say, not only can I do my job, but I could actually run this whole operation because I know how to do every element of that. And that's something I experienced working, you know, a lot of commercial projects with teams. I'm just like, okay, if I can do the sound design and I can do the video editing and the 3D graphics and the programming and all of that stuff, like now I can, I can direct the situation. And that, that makes you valuable. Like that makes you very valuable because being able to communicate vision we, we all know this, right? Like, um, what's the joke about AI? Like for AI to, um, for AI to take over uh, uh, creative industries, um, it, it's never going to happen because clients are going to have to be able to accurately uh, describe what it is they want. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's never going to happen because when has a client ever been able to describe what they want? Like, <laughs> like they don't know what they want. Like that's where they're coming to the creative. So, you know, if you know how to do everything you know, the business side of it, the, the, the art side of it, the, uh, the back end, the code, whatever it may be, you can communicate to the person who's either got the job or got the opportunity. You can communicate everything to them. And that is, that is what it's about because it comes down to in the days you're doing business, you're working, you're creating with people and you have to be able to communicate with them. So I think that's probably the, the most important thing uh from the atp climb thing was there a moment of clarity where you knew exactly what you wanted to do and how uh yes yes there was i made a piece of art and i just looked at it and i just thought that's fucking sick i truly believed in what i was doing i was like that is fucking sick i'm pretty sure not many people think it's sick i would like to make people understand how sick that is and then it's like cool what is my work about? I have to try and convince people that programming art is sick and like, how am I going to educate them to understand that it's sick? Because I think a lot of people just see it and go, I don't understand it. Just like how perhaps in the early noughties, music producers struggled because, or nineties, because, you know, people be like, oh, a computer made that song and they had no fucking clue how a door works. It's like, you have to educate people, you know, so they can appreciate the artistry, the creativity of what you're doing. Um, so yeah, that was a big eureka moment for me, at least. Right. Thanks, Tom. Last question. Sorry. Like, like, roll on. Yeah, no, no. That's really insightful. Thank you. Um, should we have a little look at just your website as well? Because I guess another thing is, you know, with all these graduates is um, you're all kind of building portfolio sites to send off to clients or to showcase your work. And I think looking at, you know, having a bit of an understanding of, the skill sets Tom has built and what he's been doing and how just by going on his website, you instantly gauge what he's about um, through what he's done. And once again, he's thought about standing out compared to other websites. So if I just pass it back to you, Tom, you can. Yeah, I think actually um, I'd attribute the website to being one of the most important factors of what I do. So I think that like, you know, being able to make a good website is absolutely key because if someone checks you out online and you have a dope website, they're going to be like, Oh shit, someone must have paid or someone a lot of money to do that, which means you're successful. And 
also you're cool and you have vision and you manage to communicate that to someone that makes websites. Little do they know obviously that I made it, but being able to have websites is like, you know, Filth FM, the radio station was a success because it had a dope website, period. And so whatever you're doing, if you can teach yourself to make a website, which is relatively easy these days for things like WordPress, um, you yeah, know, that's going to set, that's going to be helpful. But yeah. I mean, my website's uh, basically, I just wanted to make like, oh, who's inside the website as well. I was like, I just thought it'd be fun to make a website that was like a metaverse, like a virtual space. And so, um, you know, my website is literally, it's like a virtual world. And so to find things, you actually walk around and go into buildings and that then opens up things like uh, portfolios where you can see like my work and if you want to see my things like my artwork I've, there's also like a little ui with the phone so you can open up that and open up my artwork i just very much wanted to create a, a website where you went on it and you're like i've never seen this before and that was something quite difficult because you have to be critical once more but you know for me it was like i want to make sure that when i play actually there's a really cool part down here because uh you know this is the thing right i've got rick and morty down here but they're like doc and doc and marty and then if you speak to doc It'd be like, oh, you're such a little, you know, little loser. I was gonna ask you if there's any Easter eggs in there. <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, you little punk ass. Yeah, yeah, take the skateboard, you little, you little bitch. Mm. And then you get to ride this uh, hoverboard. Hey. So yeah, I just I wanted to make a space. <laughs> Yo, what's up, people? <laughs> just jokes. I just wanted to make a space where it was like, you know, you you go in it and it it feels like it feels like something special. And, and I think it's not great for like clients. I have this argument all the time with my like team and they're like, you know, Tom, we just want to see, we just want to see your artwork in one place. And I'm like, okay. But at the same time, I think as great as it is for people to be able to go, Oh, I can see like, you know, your video games. It's easy to see that. Um, I think it's equally as important to make something that's artistic. So, you know, does it work as a great website? Probably not. Is it cool? Fuck yeah. <laughs> Is it me? Fuck yeah. <laughs> and I think that's like, you know, that's more, more important than anything else. Yeah, it's an expression of yourself in it. And that's your art uh, standalone thing anyway. Yeah, 100%. Like, and I, I made these little guys, which I love, the, the, they get the news from Reddit. So it's like, uh, you can speak to them and they just tell you shit off Reddit. I just thought that was funny as fuck. Like, you know, like I don't even write this shit. Like, you know, you're just in this world and this dude here is just going to chat about science, like things that people are saying. I just thought, oh, this one's great. Shower thoughts. They like drug test low paying jobs labor for the same reason. They don't drug test the highest paying jobs, socioeconomic bias. It's like dope. It's like, I don't even write that. Some dude just made some deep ass statement inside it. So that's another cool thing. It's like, you know, stand on the stand on the shoulders, so to speak, of, uh, of other creatives in some capacity. On, on that note, Tom, um, yeah. do, you, do you want to talk a little bit about your um, depression piece that you've done and how yeah, that sure. how you've used technology to, um, to to support and help sort of this creative idea that you had? Yeah, sure. Um, so like that was the second thing I ever made. I was like, I was like really struggling. I was struggling with depression for like my whole life, so to speak, since I was like 17 or 18 and my dad left. And that was like a hard, hard moment. So I was really trying to like express that, you know, like I think a lot of people have yeah, abandonment issues or stuff like that happen to them and they don't really know how to deal with that. So for me, it was like, all right, I'm trying to express that. And I was just like really struggling. How the fuck do I connect with people? How do I express that or whatever? So I made this... Um, I was trying to find people like I was on Reddit a lot and I was trying to find people that were depressed so I could just like chat to them and not feel alone. So I ended up making uh, this, which is a, um, oh, this one's actually about weed, oh dear. But anyway, I made this like mirror that would take real time tweets off of Twitter and it would just take all of the data and then I would just typewrite it. So I actually have it, uh, 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 Yeah, depressed.network, you can go and do it yourself. Um, yeah, it just goes and grabs the most real-time tweet about depression and then typewrites it and, and uses sentiment analysis to try and work out if it's a human or not. And that was the piece that I think got me in, uh, I won awards for, am I depressed or dying? So deep, screenshot, quick gang, pow. Um, 
so yeah like that that was like for me very much a case of you know i wanted to express something and what better way than doing it in real time like around the world like someone is just that like this person has just said to jamie like depressed they've just done that i think that's i think that's beautiful like taking that and this is the thing i didn't make twitter like you could just type in depressed to twitter and you see this shit and that's the thing about art like it's like what rick rubin says about making like when he's producing an album like Sometimes his job is just to reduce the fucking thing down. It's to take all that craziness and make it simple. And that's all I'm doing here. I'm taking that crazy idea of social media and the feed and scrolling and loads of topics and just making it one thing that you can see that's slower, like slowing the rate of which you could, you know, uh, get the data. So, yeah, like, you know, think about that very much, I guess. I think it's important in your practice to think about how can you how can you apply something that's already been made or how can you hack something apart that's already been made and apply that to you in the hope of trying to make it um, you know, more relatable? That's amazing. Thanks, Tom. Um, and it's quite, near the, it's quite near the end now, but um, just wanted to ask. So, I mean, being a multidisciplinary artist yourself um, and having some experience and, well, extensive experience, what what advice would you give students who you know want to explore this sort of innovation and artistic route and they kind of have the skill sets maybe to play with sound and doing some coding and generative stuff with sound what um what advice would you give them or i guess I'm trying to think how to, yeah so what advice would you give in terms of ask uh getting them to sort of work with other media media as well like to cross yeah. across different disciplines. Have you guys seen this? Have you seen Sonic Pi? Can I get a shout out in the in the chat room if you guys have seen this? This is a um, uh, a programming uh, language to make music. I, you won't be able to hear it, but you should all check this out because it's super fun. Like you can program like songs, and I use it for live performance sometimes, just for shits and gigs. But yeah, like um, what advice? Uh, like uh i wish i could play music to you guys i don't I, I wish i could do that but um i actually like someone said something about making music for video games and um and stuff like that i'm like what advice would i have um no one cares about how it's made that's a big thing like realistically speaking sometimes it doesn't matter how it's made like my music for my video games is made using a, uh, a door that's in a web browser that's for making like chip tune and it ends up sounding juicy and fat. And, and I'm just like, I just, it's made in a simple fucking point and click program. Like, you know, whatever you're doing, it's like, it's about the end product. It's about the end product and that's it. And the process isn't really, you know, the process, the point of the process in any artistic endeavor is to reduce the amount of time and the complexity it takes you to make something of high quality. So your process isn't something you should think of as like, you know, it should be something where you're just like fucking, you know, for me, it's like when I'm writing code, I'm just throwing that shit together, like fucking crazy. And it's not like super planned out. It's like painting. I believe very much in like the Van Gogh principle of when you sit down and you make something, you just paint it in one sitting. It's just like a flow. I mean, every artist has their process. Some artists spend months making their work. But for me, I like the idea of I'm just going to make this now. And if I make it, then it's art. So for you guys, it's like you make something, it's music. Like, so, you know, if whatever industry you want to try and get into, if you want to do installations, sound design, that stuff, like the best way is to start. And you can buy a projector on Amazon for a hundred bucks. And I don't believe that anyone, you know, can't spend a hundred bucks on something in today's world. Like you think about, you know, all the stuff that we need need to buy, like buy a projector, you know, project something on the building next door. That's like literally what I did, like projected on the building opposite me and the record a video and then put that into Premiere Pro and then try and make some music for it. You know, like just, just, just fucking go, just do stuff. And if you do the right kind of stuff and or you do stuff that's, you know, a unique idea, and if you have to, you have to be really like really, really critical of yourself. I keep saying this. You can't make something go, oh, this is brilliant. And someone to be like, oh, it's already been done. You have to be super, 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 super fucking critical. And that means that if you have an idea, you need to go and look online and find 
find someone who's done it before you. And if you can't, you're onto something. Like, go run with it. Don't waste your time doing stuff that other people have done, unless you're kind of experimenting, so to speak. And then put it out. Like, put it out there. Just put it out into the world um, and be consistent with that. And you'll and people people will eventually, if you put it in the right places, they'll see it. And if anything I said today has been a testament to that, the right place could literally be a coffee shop. So it's just like, get yourself out there in any way. And, you know, be strategic. If there's someone you want to get in touch with, find out how you can get in touch with them. Like, you know, find their email, find their LinkedIn, find out where they live in a non-aggressive way and try to reach out to them. Like, I've been trying to get hold of this one dude at this company for the last five weeks. I know he ain't fucking going to get back to me. And I'm just like, oh, I need to get in touch with this dude. And I know it's like, if I had an intro from someone, bam, it would happen straight away, you know? But instead, it's like I'm fucking cold calling the dude. Like, it's a waste of time. So, you know, think about that. Like, where, where, how, how can you, how can you, everything is Lego, right? You're building a house. Like, you've got to put the first block down. You know, you can't, you can't just get the house. So find the block, pick the color, and then put another block down and keep on doing that. And it's just building blocks. And eventually you'll have a house. Or you have a Star Wars pod racer because we all love the Star Wars Lego, right? <laughs> Got a slang song. <laughs> I hope that answered it. <laughs> One thing I just wanted to quickly talk to you about was um, so you're now being represented by 360, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Management. Um, so how, how did you end up on 360 and when did you know it was the right time to work with artist management? Uh, so I did, I met, I met 360 because my like, friend of mine, um, a DJ like Nick Fanchilli, he, I was in Ibiza and I was like, I, I just landed and he was playing at Ashwaya and I was like, he was like, come through. And when I went to come through, he was like, my, my manager will come get you. And that's how I met, uh, uh, I met like the guy who's managing me now. And so I that's how I met like got in, like met the three six zero guys it was literally that it was like and and then I knew him for like a while and we partied a few places around the world like <laughs> and then yeah it was like I I knew what he did um and seeing what he's doing with with um with Nick and a few other people and I had had our management and I think for me like our management was about um like uh you know it's it's different for everyone right like you you. I have like art world people that want to want to manage me. And it's like in that moment, I'm like, what am I trying to do? What is the goal? Cause I can do, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, I can do this part of the job, but I'm looking for someone to do this part of the job. And with that, I was like, I want someone to help me out stateside. I want, I want to crack that. I want someone to help me out with commercial. I want someone who's got experience doing big, bigger commercial jobs, bigger commercial deals, more connections for people to do installations. Like that's what that's about for me. And so, you know, if you're looking like management wise and you're trying to think when, when is the right time to do that? It's like, you just have to think, what is, what is the goal of doing that? You know, what is the, what are you trying to get that from that? And it's, for me, it was like, I know full well, I am just crazy all over the place. So I need, I need a manager to be like picking up that stuff and doing stuff and keeping some sort of momentum because I'm all over the place. And I could have the biggest opportunity in the world and not do it because I spent all night making a piece of art. Like that's just the way I am. So for me, it was about, I need someone to make sure that they're on top of everything and their job is to get me to make shit and, 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 uh, and keep me kind of like steered in the right direction. It's my job to make sure there's wind in the sails, you know, I think at least, but I think it's different for everyone, you know, like it really is different for everyone. That's the cool thing about relationship with management. Um, but yeah, three six are they're, they're pretty they're pretty sick. Um, they're straight up like I've worked with other management companies before, and you know they're all different. They all like, have different uh, agendas and different like strategies and you know different ideas. And at the end of the day, it's about like what is the vision, what's the grand vision, and how do you guys get there. Um, so yeah, nice thanks. Just for anyone that don't know, so three six zero they predominantly manage but not limited to music like music artists so they've got people like um feed me calvin harris um you might be able to help me out uh, guy gerber nick fanchini and then they've got will smith the actor 
I believe, on there as well. Um, so yeah, they're quite they're quite a big management company, and it was just yeah quite interesting to see what kind of being kind of self self driven and self motivated what that kind of point was for you to work with a team like that. Um, you can't what, do everything yourself. You can't do everything yourself. Your team is you're as good as your team. So you know, like I've realized that you know it gets to the point where it's like you get to the point where you're going to be in charge of the vision and you're going to need to lean on other people to come up with stuff or to do stuff. And so, you know, picking a good team and having a solid team that know what they're doing, they're capable, um, that you trust, super important, super important. Well, I just want to say, yeah, um, that's it from me. So we'll just have a quick, we'll have a few questions because I know time is pressing yeah, sure thing. as well. I got 10 minutes, go for it. So yeah, anyone that's got any questions for Tom? Yeah, um, yeah, just uh, I yeah I know Pete from back in the day from the uh, local yes. skate park. <laughs> no way. Yeah, small world. Um, That's crazy. Yeah. yeah, he's a legend. Um, and and a somewhat irre irrelevant sort of question. Uh, but hey, I I'm a fun guy. Uh, there was uh, yeah, just the purple. I mean, uh, you find it influential. You know, uh, it helps you create, or I don't know. Wow, yeah. Um, or something a little bit more relevant, certain colors, do you find that sort of is an influencer on yeah. kind of like people or whatever? If you haven't seen James Terrell's documentaries, uh, James Terrell's a light artist that basically birthed all of this kind of aesthetic. Um, light is like incredible for uh, uh, like therapy, but also uh, mood. So for me, I like pinks, purples, blues, and it stimulates my mind creatively. It feels good to look at. And they're just LEDs, but like your creative space is super important. Some people I know like to light sage and a few candles, like, but you could have the, the shittiest room ever. Like I've been there and had like the tiny cupboard. Like I had the pull down bed. Like I lived that life where I, where I had like one room that was a cupboard and the bed pulled down and it was just, but you put some like LED bulbs in that space and you can transform it into something that, you know what I mean, feels good. And you're going to have different moods. So sometimes you want to feel blue or feel green or feel purple. So I, I really do try to embody that because at the end of the day, we're talking about creating stuff and that comes from emotion. And, you know, what you see is a massive factor in that. And so I think, yeah, the colors for me, it's like, this stuff just makes me feel good. It just makes me feel like I'm at home, you know? Like, so yeah um definitely do that definitely get some like you know led bulbs because i think it transforms your space well uh thank you for your purple radiance <laughs> anytime other questions i've got a quick one if that's all right um you said you've done lots of things in the past uh do you think that you're on the right track where you'd like to stay or do you think there's a chance that you might move into a different area or yeah what, what do you think you know how do you think you're going to progress in the next few years as you know, someone in this still developing industry do you want to stay here do you want to try new things or what yeah i think what the, the cool thing about the word artist is that like i like to describe it as the like leonardo da vinci you know traditionally artists were also engineers and inventors and that you know the idea of the artistry was that you're trying to create a process to do something that hasn't been done and so now it's like i'm very very comfortable with this idea of just being an artist because at the end of the day i'm just trying to make stuff that hasn't been done and trying to work out how to do that and and also the relationship of that stuff with us like what does it do how does it make you feel what's the point of it and all I can see in my work is that it just gets more and more abstract. Like now it's getting more and more abstract where it's like, you know, one of the things that I'm making is um, like, you know, I just like, oh, I want to try and recreate what it looks like when a, a leaf like falls off a tree. It's like super fucking abstract. And I'm like, can I make that look real? You know, that's the challenge. And how far can I go down that rabbit hole? So I think in the future, like I didn't think that last year I'd start making video games again. I spent the whole year making video games. I made a game for like Hello Kitty and I was working on one for, you know, other stuff. And I didn't think I would do that again, but I did because of COVID. So I think, you know, I don't know where I end up, but I definitely, my goal is to make like huge, 
huge installations in public spaces. That's what I really am really passionate about is how can I make something that transforms a space uh, that people live in? And Deloitte did this fantastic, and this is another thing, you got to make sure you're switched on with what's happening in the world, right? Because like Deloitte did a big thing where they found that having art in public spaces increases the GDP of a country or a city, right? And that therefore made it very easy for them to say to cities, you need to invest in having art installations in the city. So it's like, you know, you might be in a situation one day where you find someone who has that power and you need to be like, hey, did you know that having art in public spaces actually increases the GDP of a, of a, of a country, you know? You have to think about that a lot. The person you're talking to, what are they trying to do in their life? And how can I help them do that by giving them what I do? So I think, that's the key. And if Elon's like, hey, Tom, you know, I just, um, I need to make Morris feel, you know, more like Earth, you know, I might be like, all right, cool. Let's work that one out. Like, <laughs> so who knows? That'd be cool though. Thanks. Um, and thanks, Joe, for the question. So do we have any other questions before we close it off? Cool. Bobby, guys, thank you so much, by the way. Like, great questions. I like, really, really enjoyed uh, having a chat with you. I hope I answered them all uh gave you the information you were looking for um you're great man really yeah, yeah. that's amazing mate thank you uh, thank you <laughs> it's certainly it's nice uh, as someone hosting one of these who's done been quite successful in the industry you seem like a genuinely nice guy and you're not talking down at us as you know lowly students like some people may do and uh, so yeah thanks for being on our level Anytime, guys, and like massive shout outs to Tugan for giving me the opportunity to do this. Like, it's uh, it's awesome to be like, you know, chatting to you guys, and um, you know, like that's the thing. Like, this is the, I think that's the one that what you just said is quite interesting. They're like in the industry, like people aren't going to talk down to you, the people you really want to work with, and that's the thing. You just have to go into things always being like, we're all just we're all just equal, right? Like, we're just all just doing what we love, and if you do that, that authenticity will always shine through, always. So yeah, great point there, Joe. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Um, really appreciate your time and yeah. Anytime, bro. It was really inspiring and I'm sure a lot of the students had a lot to take away from there. Um, so once again, we couldn't thank you enough. Um, right. I'm gonna go get some sleep. <laughs> thank you guys. Like good luck in your endeavors. And uh, by all means, as I said, my DMs are open if you wanna hit me up. So yeah, stay safe. Peace out.